to Learning Unlocked. I'm your host, Britt Bingold. As an instructional specialist in Gilbert, Arizona, I'm a total nerd when it comes to classroom strategies and educational pedagogy. Educators are the key holders to unlocking learning for students. So today, as always, my goal is to provide you with resources and tools, the keys, to enable and accelerate learning for all students. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. Welcome back, key holders. Before we get going today, I just wanted to do a quick reminder that if you have time to rate us or write us a review on Apple Podcasts, we would appreciate it. The more reviews and ratings we get, the more educators will see our podcast. So if you like what you're hearing and you think others would too, please head over and provide us a review. Thanks so much. Welcome to episode 12 of Learning Unlocked. This is the season one wrap-up episode. I can't believe we're done with season one, and I am really excited to launch season two after winter break. I have a great lineup of guests already slotted, and we already are starting to record, um, and that just makes me feel so um, thrilled. I just, this is a a passion project for me, um, and I have to thank you know, my team, but also my director for just really encouraging me um, and allowing me to go on this podcast journey. And I also just want to thank all the listeners who have um, tuned in and um, written us reviews. I I just really appreciate you. So I thought it was um, just really the, the greatest way to end our first season was with Miss Vicki Jones. Um, she is the Director of Professional Growth um, for Gilbert Public Schools, and this is her 30th year in education. Prior to her work in professional growth, she was a high school social studies teacher. She was an assistant principal and a district level coordinator for special education. So I just felt that wealth of knowledge all rolled together really was the greatest ending to this first season of this podcast. Today, we are discussing what we call the game plan, which is essentially just an analogy um, we are using throughout the episode to reference intentional instruction using the rigor and relevance framework. I am so excited for you guys to listen to this final episode uh, with Miss Vicki Jones, and I know you are going to enjoy it. Here is my interview with Vicki. Hey, Vicki, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Um, how are you doing? Doing great, Brett. How are you? I'm doing well. I mean, it's Wednesday, it's hump day. I'm trying to make it through the week. Um, but I'm really excited today because we're talking about some passionate topics, I think, of both of ours, which is basically the game plan of teaching, um, which includes leveraging high yield strategies and intentional instruction um, and design, with also just scaffolding and cooperative learning. So I think that's pretty awesome. But before we get started, can you just quickly introduce yourself to our listeners? Absolutely. Um, Definitely some of my favorite things to talk about for sure. And and I'm excited to be able to have that conversation with you today. Um, I am currently the the Director of Professional Growth for Gilbert Public Schools, and I'm in my fourth year uh, in that position. But uh, this is my 30th year in education. I've done a lot of things throughout my years. Uh, But I have to say this by far is my favorite role in education. Um, I get to work with teachers and administrators every day um, who are out there creating memories and and directly impacting student lives. And it's really cool to be a little part of that and to help them um, get the the resources and and some direction and support that they need uh, to be awesome with those kids every day. Um, I will agree with you in terms of when we talk about instruction, it's, it's one of those things that I really do feel passionate about um, because it really fits into this idea that I have that we should always be in a state of perpetual growth um, and that education is always evolving and, and we have to feel passionate about and accept that um, that, that is true about education. Uh, it's one of the coolest things is it's always changing um, and there's always something new and exciting to do. And, and uh, I think it's what's kept me excited um, over the course of 30 years. So um, aside from that passion, um, I'm also pretty darn passionate about the Kansas City Chiefs, um, but I'm not sure that's why you had me on uh, today. So we might have to get to them later. 
See, and here the whole time I thought you were passionate about coming to work because of me, but now I've learned so much about <laughs> your true passions. Yeah, it doesn't, um, it doesn't hurt that you're at work. <laughs> here, so that's, that's no. what I do. But, uh, I think you definitely share the passion of, we love both you and I, the, the structure of education and um, what impacts students constantly changes and moves and all those moving parts and figuring out how we can help teachers uh, move and adjust with those parts. Um, to make students learning better, but that's for sure. And, and your chiefs are doing great, so I can't really say anything bad about that. So I guess we'll move on. Um, so, okay, let's talk about instruction first. So planning for instructing instruction is something that every teacher does, right? We all sit down, we have to plan out what we're doing. Um, and sometimes that's independently, and then sometimes that's part of like a team, like here we are calling them data teams or PLCs. Um, but the execution of that planning and the results that they have with students can look really different in the end. Like you might plan together, but the two parts might look completely different into different classrooms. So I've heard you talk to teachers and administrators about instructional planning versus just lesson planning. Can you just share your perspective um, kind of on this overview of the differences between the two just to start our discussion on this topic? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um... This is something that it was kind of an aha moment for me, not too terribly long ago, um, is we, we've we talked a lot about instruction here in, in the district and, and how do we put all of those pieces together and how do we get the most bang for our buck, right? And and it occurred to me that uh, for many years in education, and, and I've been around since before there were standards, so um, I, I've been around for a while. And for a lot of years, lesson planning was really done in isolation of, or regardless of the kids who are in your classroom and in front of you, it really didn't take into account that student population. Um, we were handed a textbook, um, we might be handed a curriculum map, and, um, and now some standards, right? And it's actually possible for people to lesson plan for the entire year. And I've seen teachers do that, right? Um, and, and I think we get, we think we're, we're trying to get ahead of the game when we do that, but I sometimes think that, that we trap ourselves or we get trapped in this lesson planning conundrum because we've tied ourselves to a, a timeline and a model that we're not always willing to adjust based on where our kids are at. And, and sometimes what that ends up creating for us when we don't take our kids into consideration is this, this shot at the middle. Uh, and, and lesson planning can sometimes create this idea of surface learning in our classrooms. Uh, versus a deeper learning model. And when we're, when we're focused at the middle and we're hoping that some of the high kids come along for the ride and some of the low kids can keep up with us um, and, we're, and we're looking at this big scope and sequence of things that we need to cover, um, it's really difficult sometimes to get out of that quadrant A, right? It's, it, it ends up being this, this idea of, I have a lot of information um, and, and I need to, to get it out to my kids. It almost, it's almost like our, our curriculum becomes a survey course, if, if we remember those from college. And, and, and that's, that's really kind of difficult. And, and assessment becomes the autopsy, right? We, we, we plan a unit, we deliver a unit, we hope the kids learn from the unit, and then we take a test to see if they learn. Well, if they didn't, what do we do? We move on anyway, right? And, and I think that because that's what the lesson plan says that we have to do. That's what our map says that we have to do. Um, you and I just had this conversation not too long ago um, that we just heard from um, or we just read an article that um, up to 50 percent of what we're teaching in a classroom, especially early on in the year, um, is, is information that kids already know. Right. And then and then we wonder why we can't keep them engaged. And so um, if we lesson plan with our students in mind, we really run the risk of having a classroom that doesn't feel personal to kids and they're either redoing things they already know or they're so far behind um, that, that we don't catch up and we don't catch them because we autopsy at the end. Instructional planning, on the other hand, is really, really intentional. And, and it starts with the idea, in, and in my head, when, when we talk about instructional planning, it really starts with this idea that everything is coherent and goes together. There aren't any straggler or stray pieces. We're really purposeful about the, uh, the priority or focus standards that we choose, right? Um, we really choose those standards uh, because they give kids a deep understanding 
of what the kids are going to learn. And it also, we have a, we also need to have a deep understanding of our own standards to know how the supporting standards go with those, right? So we have this whole picture in mind. We're not giving equal time and equal attention to every single standard. Um, we're saying this is what's really important for our kids to know. This is what supports that learning, right? And we get those down into those really workable learning goals for our kids. And when we get that kind of clarity in our own head, we know what the learning goals are. We can break those down into daily learning targets. We use I can statements in Gilbert, right? Um, the things that the kids are going to know. Um, and all of those things are connected, right? It's not, it's not random pieces of information here or there. We use pretests so that we know where kids are at so that if they've already accomplished something, if they've already maintained a level, we get to move on. We're not going to keep them stuck in that spot. Um, we're going to let them move on and, and let them go. It speaks to if you know what your targets are and you know what your learning progressions are, you automatically know how to scaffold for students. Um, I can start a small group in down in maybe some some lower foundational skills, but I can let my kids that are already moving on, I can let them move on a little bit and I can I can give them something that's a little bit deeper and richer to work on. And, and so it really speaks to that. Um, it speaks to planning instructional practices that are really tied directly to what do I hope to accomplish. And it also speaks to formative assessment that ties directly to my instruction that ties directly to that standard I'm working on. And so when I talk about instructional planning, it really is this idea that there aren't any stray fragments. Um, everything is really lines up and, and speaks back to that standard. And, and, and if we're really purposeful about that, um, and we use those frequent and authentic assessments, our ability to one, have clarity for ourselves and two, articulate that clarity to our kids is really amazing. Um, and it's really amazing to see the level of student engagement when kids know what they're doing, why they're doing it, and you give them a really rich experience in which to learn that. So that for me is the difference between a lesson planning, which is completely separate from your kids, and instructional planning, which is absolutely laser focused on what are the most essential things for my kids to know and how do I get them there? Absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to think back. I want to say in college, I was taught the Madeline Hunter lesson plan. And then we were taught universal backwards design. So those were like the two things that I came out of college kind of knowing. Um, so I knew I had to start from the, you know, backwards and back into it, but never did I have my students in mind. I was just lesson planning. At least I was lesson planning towards my end goal, which was great. But I never, I could, I could easily teach the same lesson every single year to totally different groups of kids. And I would have absolutely no idea where any of them were out at the beginning of the year. Um, I would just do my lesson plan. I would just plan it. It was more um, teacher focused, I think, than student focused. And I think when we think about instructional planning now of being intentional, it's intentional for us as teachers to give us clarity. But um, it really is more important that it's the students that give you clarity. And it's, it's even more important that this, it's the students you have in front of you this year. Like, every year you're going to get a new crop and you're the kind of constant and you've got to look at those kids and be like let's do that like you said let's do that pretest let's get where everybody is so that way we're not we can start where we need to start and i think i mean i used to just plan out my whole quarter on a google calendar and be like "Woo, my lesson planning's done i'm good i know how to make my copies and honestly I would never follow it because what would happen was I would realize, oh, these kids didn't do well on this or this, these kids weren't ready for this. And I would end up changing it anyways. So why are we not working on maybe like a two to two to three ish week basis um, instructionally planning with the kids in mind first? And, and it's hard to do that when you're alone, but I think it's a lot easier when you do it with a team and you're also seeing common trends with your team and thinking, Ugh, I think we need to drop this project because we need to go back to this other thing. Right. So, and, and you know, where I got really passionate about this, or it really kind of struck me is really early in my career. And I, I actually taught across the hall from a person who I call him the file cabinet teacher. Um, <laughs> right. and, and yeah, I mean, it's and, and great guy. Right. But, um, but he had three big file cabinets and literally like, I don't think other than the fact that like, you know, the day of the week changes every year, you know, how, you know, Monday this year is Tuesday next year. Um, I really think like that's all the further off he ever was. Um, and in terms of if, if something happened on September 4th, it was happening on September 4th again next year. 
And um, the same, the same copies. I mean, he didn't even bother to retype them when we went from, you know, ditto machines to, to computers. So, oh my gosh. So yeah, I mean, it was, I used to, I used to just think like, wow, like how does, how does that happen? Um, and it's not that I think people need to go back and blow up their plans every single year and reinvent the wheel. Right. Yeah. But I do think like you were saying, if we don't keep in mind the group of kids we have in front of us, um, we're wasting time. We're wasting our own time, which there's never enough of. Um, right. The number one complaint I hear from teachers, right, is I don't have enough time to cover all of my curriculum. Oh, and, you just um, cover. You just made me. You just made me like twitch a little. I hate that word. Um, yeah, because you shouldn't cover it. You got to go deeper, and you got to know what the kids are are learning. And I felt like I would just. It was wasting my time to plan that much. Like, why am I planning a quarter or a semester when I have to blow it up sometimes because the kids in front of me are just not there? Right. Yeah. And 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 it and it it provides us like this some teachers have a false sense of security where, you know, I, and, and it's, and it's pressure, right? We have state tests, we have exams, we have all of that kind of stuff. And it's just like, I, I've, I've mapped this out and my map says, this is where I need to be. And if I'm not there, I'm not going to finish. And I think that becomes the pressure. And, and so we, we become a, we become a servant to our map or a servant to our lesson plan rather than a servant to our students. And, and sometimes, you know, and I think even COVID made me think about this too, because when, when our teachers were coming back, both in the spring and, and then the summer when we started a new school year, I think one of the biggest struggles I heard from, from our teachers as, as well as teachers that I, that I know in different places was like, what do I cut, right? I don't, I don't know what I cut because they've given equal weight and equal value to everything. And and if you if you really focus in on those really big priority standards that can take you deeper, it becomes really apparent what's okay to cut, right? And so I think I think it allows you more flexibility as a teacher to be able to say, you know what, I'm running out of time for this covering, right? Um, I'm going to give this up. There's some things I can give up. I can afford to give them up so that I can ensure my kids have this really deep, really cool, really enriching experience, and it's going to be okay. Um, because and there's it's going to be okay because they're still covering their targets, you know, to that yeah. standard. Yeah. Yeah. I know there is really cutesy stuff that I love to do doing. And I'm not saying not to have fun. I mean, I love having fun in the classroom. But there were certain things that I was like, that really wasn't serving the purpose I, of the standard or the skill or the concept that I was trying to get to. It was just kind of like it went with the unit and it was fun. So but I could do something else that was just as fun and just as interesting, but it would serve more and I could go deeper and go longer. So I think just like reevaluating that, that's right. intentional planning. Right. And I had a teacher, I, I was observing a teacher once years and years and years ago and um, a young teacher. And uh, this teacher did something different every 20 minutes, right? They lectured for 20 minutes and then they had the kids do, they were, they were on an immigration unit. It was a social studies class. And, mm -hmm. and they had the kids draw an immigrant, right? They had to take out a piece of paper and, and draw an immigrant and give them clothes and a name and a haircut and like all that kind of stuff. And I was kind of, huh, I wonder what that has to do with anything, right? And so in the post-conference, we had this conversation <clears throat> that says, tell me about the, the draw the immigrant activity, right? Um, right. And, and the teacher said, like, I know I'm not supposed to lecture all hour and I thought this would be fun for the kids, right? And she goes, and they seem to like it. And I'm like, yeah, tell me what they learned from it, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, well, that wasn't the consideration. The consideration was somewhere along the line, told me I, somebody told me I should only do 20 minute segments of things. So this right. was my 20 minute segment. It, did, it really didn't have anything to do with anything, but they, right. they wanted the kids to be engaged. And so we do things sometimes, um, with we're well intentioned, yes. But they, yeah. but we don't, we aren't, we aren't intentional enough in, in our planning where we know for sure that that activity is going to take the kids further and deeper in their understanding. And I think that's really what it's all about: is whatever activity that is, does it take me deeper or does it just take time? Yes. Does is it just filling or um, giving the kids an opportunity? Now, if she would have said, 
we just, you know, finished this unit or we're in the middle of an immigration unit on different immigrants coming. And they did that as part of their notes and they were sketching an immigrant and then they were going to add that, you know, their notes into that immigrant's picture and, you know, whatever, that would have been different, you know, but yeah. to have it ha just be lingering there with no yeah. connection. Is yeah, if, it's, if it's a sketch note where you're putting together concepts and you're adding and you're summarizing, right? Right. Sketch note would have been totally appropriate for this. Right. And, and give me a, give me an image that that depicts like your deeper learning of this concept. Yeah. But just to draw an immigrant and give them a name and <laughs> and a haircut, not so much. Haircut, not so much. Yeah. Right. Totally. So, yeah. So, okay, so our department, professional growth and development, we really stress um, cooperative learning as a, as a gateway to rigorous learning. And it's been so hard with COVID, um, you know, digital cooperative learning. And then now that we're back in the classroom, even with them being six feet apart, how do we do that cooperative learning? Um, I think um, teachers are starting slowly to figure that out. I mean, we've given them a lot of resources as far as, okay, maybe do this with them and have this, you know, they can still talk. They just have to be a little bit further apart and they through their mask. So I think they're starting to be a less afraid of getting kids together, maybe in the hallways or outside now that it's getting nice out for us in Arizona. Um, but I just, why do you think and, and why in your vision when you were starting the department, do we want to stress this idea of cooperative learning because we wanted to get them to that rigor? Right. The short answer is that deeper learning only happens when students are really engaged with the content and with one another. And, and that's, that's supported by, by Hattie's research. Um, but when you think about, I always think about how kids learn naturally before we send them to school, right? They mimic, they watch, they try, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail, they'll try again, they ask questions, they ask a lot of questions, um, they experiment, they look for feedback, right? Like that's, that's a three-year-old right there. Right. Um, yep. And, and, you know, and it's, and it's cool to watch, like kids learn so much outside the context of formal education. And, and I've always been a big advocate of why wouldn't we use our natural instincts to our favor instead of fighting them? And so if that's how our brain works naturally, if that's if that curiosity and that desire to explore and to put hands on and to ask questions and to and to ask for feedback from people, and that's what we ask questions for. Right. Um, if that's our natural desire, why wouldn't we tap into that? Um, and when you when you look at Hattie's work and you explore what works in terms of student learning, it really becomes even more clear that that natural desire and, and, and curiosity as it involves other people really does work to our advantage, right? Um, we are, human beings are social creatures. Mm -hmm. We need to be with other people. And we learn so much more through our conversations with other people. Um, during when I was working with some new teachers last year, I came across a statistic um, from the World Economic Forum. And it estimated that 65% of the kids who enter primary grades um, in the last couple of years will eventually end up employed in jobs that don't currently exist. And that's just crazy. Like 65% of our kids who are in primary grades right now, we can't prepare them for a job because the job that they're going to have doesn't exist right now. And I don't even, I mean, I completely can see that because what we, I, what I'm doing now in my position, I never thought I would be doing as a, at when I graduated with from college or from high school, I mean, things just change so quickly. Technology changes so quickly, um, and and our, um, I mean, even think about COVID, a pandemic it can hit and change the workforce completely. And so you can't really train students for that. And I think when we say cooperative work, people automatically are like, oh, well, we have to do this because eventually you're going to have to work together with people you don't like and blah, blah, blah. But there's just so much more to it than that. It's deeper yeah. than that. It's, it's way deeper than that. And I, you know, and I'll go back to that. My first experience with cooperative learning was a disaster. Like I swore I'd never put kids in a group again. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was terrible. It was awful. And it was all my fault. And um, when I reflect on that and I look at what I didn't do is, is I was doing, I was doing group work. I wasn't really doing collaborative work and because collaborative work has structure, right? Collaborative work has an end goal in mind. Collaborative work has 
has a, a learning target at the end of it that, that we guide kids to, to achieve. And, and, and it gives them roles and structure and the things that they're supposed to do. Um, for me, you know, it's the, the, the age old question. I taught social studies in high school. We all know that that's every kid's favorite subject area and um, not. And, and kids every day, Miss Jones, why do we got to learn this, right? Um, and there were days like I didn't have a good answer. <laughs> yeah. That was, that's unacceptable, right? right. That, that's, that's unacceptable for me not to know why the heck I'm making you do this. And so sometimes, especially in, in, a, in a content area like social studies that can seem really antiquated, we have to get away from our content is the important thing. And, and really focus on what skill am I teaching them? And so when I look at what we're trying to prep our, that, that future focus that we're trying to prep our kids for, and I'm looking at like Fortune 500 company survey that says the, the, the things that kids need but aren't coming out of school with are things like complex problem solving. It's critical thinking. It's the ability to coordinate with others. It's the negotiation is on their list, right? The ability to negotiate um, different um, options and opinions and, and come to consensus, right? Um, cognitive flexibility, not being stuck in a, in a fixed mindset. Um, I can take and, and, and do those skills um, with, with the content that I'm given. And so even if the content doesn't seem relevant to a kid, what, what kind of problems did these leaders have to solve when they were trying to make the decision that they made, right? Um, and and what, what are some of those things that, what if you were in that position? What if you were in that role? What if you had to get these four countries together to make a decision about this, right? So, I mean, th those skill sets um, really can add to um, that complexity. So not only is it like, what am I going to do when I leave? What am I going to do when I leave school? What's my future world and my future job going to look like? But it's also just educationally sound. Right. We're, we're Hattie geeks in the professional growth department. Um, we are. We are. We walk around like throwing out effect sizes. And, and I look at the, I do, I look at the list of effect sizes that are tied to some of those collaborative processes, right? Um, Self-report grading, where kids are able to understand their learning progression and be able to articulate either to, to others, to themselves, or to their teacher where they're at is off the charts. 1.3 is the effect size, right? Yeah. Um, not even on the chart. Yeah. <laughs> not even on the chart. The chart doesn't even go that high. You know, classroom discussion is a 0.82. That's two years worth of growth over one year's time. Um, you know, reciprocal teaching is a 0.74. Giving feedback, and it doesn't have to be teacher feedback to students. That can be student to student, is a 0.73. So when you look at all of those things, and, and I think of all of those things in this concept of, an, of intentional planning, right? is that I have to make sure that, yeah, those are important skill sets for future focused learning, but they're also things that are going to be and have been have proven to be really super effective. So when I'm planning with my standard, now my, my next job when I'm intentional is what instructional strategy is going to get me to where I wanna go with the depth and complexity that that standard requires. And so it all rolls back into this idea that, that every step of my planning has to be intentional and has to be focused on how do I get the, the best bang for my buck for my kids. Well, and that just makes sense. I mean, if you look at, okay, what do executives want when they see kids come out of college or the work high school or wherever? And if you look at the negotiation and cognitive flexibility, that's classroom discussion right there. They have to be able to maybe be in an argument or a Socratic seminar where they have to negotiate with each other. They have to be flexible to see other points of view. That's why it's so high. It's point A2 because it's an applicable life skill. It's a relevant life skill. And if you gave them a scenario that was an actual real life scenario that had to do with your historical um, you know, curriculum or your, your, you know, and then, so now you're getting the skills from the standard, you're getting the strategy from the research, and then you're also getting the life skills, um, all tied together. You're intentionally planning for your kids and your kids are going to now want to run into social studies. They're going to, they they get it. They're, they, they have clarity and they're excited. Um, and that's when all of those pieces kind of fit together in that puzzle for the teacher and the student. Um, and that's when you see kids just grow and they grow in a way that, I mean, they fail as well, but there's that productive struggle where they're like, this is hard, but this is like nothing I've done before in school. And I've had so many kids say that to me where it's like, this is a really hard class. And I said, it's okay. You'll like me next year. 
Um, and they would look at me like I was insane, but like they would. Then the following year, I would get these kids or maybe around fourth quarter and they're like, yeah, I get it now. And I'm like, because I'm trying to get you guys to, you know, they just hated that I would never just give them an answer. Like there was always a question. There was always a poll, like, um, you know, cause I was trying to give them opportunities to problem solve, to critical think, to coordinate with their partner, figure this out together, like get hands on. Well, and yeah. I tell you, some of the best lessons I've ever learned in life are, are because I failed at something um, and, I, and I wasn't successful. And and it's it, it's interesting. Um, I was actually home visiting my mom not too long ago, and she asked me to do something. Um, and, and I don't even remember what it was. I was putting something together or taking something apart, whatever it was. And, um, and I couldn't get something to work. And it was driving me crazy. And, and she goes, just don't worry about it. It's fine. And I'm like, nope, I got to figure this out. I, I spent like an hour and a half. Um, trying to do whatever it was. And, and she's like, you know, you've always been like, since you were a kid, like you just, you, you get on a mission. Right. Um, but I learned something every time. Like it, it's one of those things where um, the, it, it is such a cool feeling. I think maybe that's why I get so passionate about it for kids is there's nothing cooler than finding a problem that, that you don't think you can solve or somebody else doesn't think they can solve. And you, and you work your way through that problem. Um, and, and granted, like this was a task that should have taken me 15 minutes and it took me an hour and a half, but by golly, I got her done. Um, and, and it's just, there's something rewarding at the end, the other end of that. And that's that, that perseverance and that, that, um, that we want our kids to have that productive struggle, because if they've got that, when they face something out in the world, they're solid. Right. They are because they've got intrinsic motivation. Yeah. I think a lot of teachers struggle with, you know, how do I get my kids motivated to learn? Um, and my main thing is, well, are they intrinsically motivated and how are you fostering that? Um, and that's a, that's a hard question to answer. And they're like, I don't, I don't know. Isn't that just an innate thing? And I'm like, well, for some people, it for sure is. But I think we also, as teachers, have to foster that through the way we intentionally plan. And, and that's why we're calling it the game plan, right? Like you really do, like a coach, have to look at your players, right, your students, and look at your game plan and think to yourself, okay, what do I need to do for this team, this classroom, this group of kids to be successful um, and do well, which I think leads us really well into our, our next question. Um, I got this quote from Grant Wiggins, and he said that coming to school every day is like playing on a team, yet you get to practice and do all the drills, but you don't get to play very many games. And so when students play the game in this metaphor, what we really mean is that students are getting multiple opportunities to transfer their knowledge and prove that they know the drills and the plays. But in order to do this, we must allow for scrimmages before the games um, and those types of things. So I was thinking, and I thought of you when I heard this because football and I know how you love your Kansas City Chiefs. And I thought this is totally up Vicky's alley because she's going to love this metaphor. But what are your thoughts on the metaphor? And like, how do you think it can help teachers when they're thinking about intentional instruction and building their game plan and, and moving away from maybe just that lesson plan um, in terms of rigor and relevance for their students so that their students can start to become, you know, intrinsically motivated by productive struggle, which it seems counterintuitive, but it works. Oh, yeah. And I love the analogy. Um, and yes, I mean, it, it's, I, I grew up around sports and I, and I still love sports. Um, and, and it's, the, the, there's a great irony. I, I was, I was a social studies teacher and, and there was always kind of the running joke in terms of like the social studies department was the coaches department, right? Right. Um, I was not a coach, um, but I was a coach when I was younger and I was a coach outside of school. And, and I learned a lot from sports and per, both participating in sports and coaching and coaching sports. And if you really think about how a coach approaches their team and how they prep their team, it really isn't a lot different than instructional planning. Um, you just do the different content, right? Um, it, it's one of those things, like, I, I think to myself when I was listening to the question and, I, and I'm sitting here thinking, like, never as a coach would I take my team to the field and put them out there to play a game without practicing. Right? <laughs> they, right. would, they would get absolutely killed, right? Um, and on the flip side, though, I would never take my team and only ever do drills with them. Or talk about, or just talk about the game to them. Like, lecture about football. Here's how it works, right? Yeah. 
you take the ball, you hold it in your hand you yeah. and, and never <laughs> give them a football. But even if I give them a football, right? Even if I give them a football and I, and I, and I let them throw the ball or a basketball and I let them dribble, right? Or I put them in front of a, of a, of a block sleigh uh, or a blocking sled. You know, I, I, I can put them through all of those drills. But one, you know, where, where does the connection come? And two, like, who's going to stick around for that? Like, if I yeah. forget to play the game, like, uh -huh. who's going to stick around? So it's those in-between moments. It's the, it's the stuff that happens in between my foundational skills and the game that is where magic happens, right? That's the scrimmage that you talk about. It's, it's what allows athletes to apply the foundational skills they've learned to new and more complex situations. They get to try new things. They get to make mistakes. And then I get to coach them up and then they can go back and make adjustments. So since you mentioned Kansas City, I'm with Patrick Mahomes, right? The guy, the guy is a genius. He's the best quarterback in the NFL by far. And it's not even just because I'm biased. But can you imagine if when Patrick Mahomes went to play football, they gave him a football and they just told him to throw it, right? Just throw the ball. Just throw the ball. Right. That's all you got to do. You just got to, because in, inherently his job is to throw the ball and to hand the ball off. That's what his job is. He has two jobs, right? <clears throat> Every once in a while he'll run it. But, but really, like, so if I just give him the ball and he just throws it, does he become Patrick Mahomes? No, he doesn't, right? Because there's a lot of people that can throw a ball 20 yards down the field in a spiral motion, right? It doesn't, it's the, it's the other stuff. When, when he gets, when he got good at throwing a ball, they put him in different situations and circumstances where he could use the other knowledge that he had, the knowledge of of taking certain lines and the the way that his body can contort to throw something the knowledge that if i look one way and throw the other way it's gonna it's gonna throw off the defenders like he does all of these things i guarantee you that the no look pass is not an improvisation he practices it every day in practice so that it looks like it's just something he made up while he's out there right um but he can't do that unless you put defenders in his face and unless you put him in situations where he has to read defenses and do the things that he does. He's not Patrick Mahomes if he's just throwing the ball. And so I, when I think about kids in class, it's, it's, it's really the same way, right? If all I ever do is drill and kill, if all I ever do is worksheets, if all I ever do is foundational skills, when do they have the opportunity to become Patrick Mahomes? Right. When do they have the opportunity <clears throat> to become the MVP of the NFL instead of the guy who got picked in the seventh round? Right. When do they have the, the opportunity or the guy who didn't get picked at all? When do they have the opportunity to put it all together and be exceptional? And, and I think but but you also can't take them just to the game to do that. Right. You can't go from throwing the ball to here's a game situation. And, and, and expect them to learn on the fly when they do that. And so it's the it's the magic in between that. It's the magic that when I teach my kids foundational skills and we, and we, and we learn those and, and we have those that I now know that we're done with the foundational skills. We don't have to keep being really specific about teaching those intentionally, right? We can now loop those foundational skills into bigger, more complex problems. We can make them part of a more complex learning. We can we can really scrimmage this out. We're going to put a lot of different ideas together and we're going to see what you come up with, right? And that's where the magic comes in because now I'm there to give them feedback. I'm there to talk about where they they made their mistakes or where they really excelled or that was a really creative and inventive way to, to approach that. And I get to coach them up so that when game time comes and whether game time is, is a classroom exam or whether it's a big stakes exam at the end of the year, when game time comes, right? They're ready and they're comfortable and they're confident. And it looks like they do it on the fly. And that's the, that's the beauty of that in between time where you get to do the really complex things, but it's in a safe atmosphere. I think sometimes teachers get stuck in the drill and kill because we know it works. We know that flashcards work or we know that, you know, we know those types of things work, but if we don't apply then what they've learned from that drill and kill into a new situation, into a complex experience and let them struggle, let them grapple a little bit. Um, and you need to let them know that it's okay. I mean, I would tell my kids all the time, like that's why I call it productive struggle. Like I understand this is hard. I understand that, but this is productive for you because you're having to use your critical thinking skills, but it's also productive for me because it's informing me as an educator 
what I need to do to coach you up. What do I need to do next when we do another drill and kill um, the next couple of days? And then we're going to try another scrimmage again, you know, because we don't want kids, um, you know, ill prepared for the game. We want them to feel super confident and, and you know, totally um excited and ready to go. I mean, if they shouldn't have that test anxiety if they've gotten like a lot more opportunities to scrimmage, but the scrimmages need to throw curveballs. They need to be complex and they, that I think will intrinsically motivate kids. I think kids are sick of, you know, Hey, I can just look this answer up on my phone or I can scan a math worksheet with my app and it'll solve all the problems for me. Like they have that stuff at their fingertips as a teacher, we have to now go past that and think, what are things that they cannot? I mean, that was my goal. And I know working with Julia, that was our goal. What can they not find on the internet? Like everything was from our brains. And yeah, it made our brains hurt, but we wanted their scrimmages to be something they could not find. Like they really had to apply those drills um, well, and, and I, those concepts. I'm sorry. And I think when you get into that drill, the thing that we have to keep in mind is, yes, the kids get bored with it and, and they don't see the relevance in spending a lot of time on something that they can look up on Google. And I happen to agree with them totally. But but the other thing we have to keep in mind with, with drill and kill a lot of times, it keeps us in quadrant A. It right? does. Yeah. It keeps us, it keeps us in, the, in the knowledge and acquisition realm. <clears throat> that is not intrinsically motivating to any of us. Right? It, it's not. It's like reading an encyclopedia, right? It's like reading the dictionary. Drill and kill that keeps you in getting fact-based information, but never being able to do anything with it or to think about it in any way. Um, that's what loses your kids. When you talk about student engagement, the longer you hang out in quadrant A, the faster you will lose your kids. And so, yeah, there's times you have to be there. There's times you have to set that foundational uh, piece of information. But if you're really working, and that's where I go back to int intentional planning, right? If you're really working on a big priority standard, right, you have to get out of drill and kill because that standard is going to be written at a much more complex and deep level than you'll ever get to if you stay in quadrant A. And so, yeah, go to quadrant A, build those foundational skills. Uh, you can't play basketball until you learn to dribble a basketball, right? You, you, can't, you can't play be a lineman in the NFL until you learn to block somebody. There, there are foundational skills we all have to work on, and, and, and that's important. We just can't stay there because you will lose your kids and you'll lose your mind. I mean, that's there. If you go to, a, a, if you ever walk into a classroom as a teacher and you think, I can't believe I have to teach this today. Yeah, like it's awful, right? Because if you can't get into it, and like you, you paid to go to school to study this, right? Um, if you can't get into it. That 15 year old, they're done before you ever get started. So I think we have to connect those two. I think you're absolutely right. I think we have to make the connection between those two things um, in, in terms of it, it can never stop at drill and kill, right? It can never stop in quadrant A. We have to get them someplace else if we want the kids to come along for the ride. And I'll tell you what, I've seen teachers, I saw a fourth grade classroom where the teacher purposefully taught the concept of productive struggle. The kids knew the word and they knew what it meant and they knew what it looked like in practice. Right. Mm -hmm. And my my kids did. I mean, they just knew it. And I would tell them, if you guys don't fail, I don't know what to do. Like, what's my purpose here? Like sometimes with writing and stuff, you know, like I would I, I would always give them a writing pretest about um, in the op the the object was to write your worst essay you've ever written. And they looked at me like, what? And I was like, I want to know what you think is the worst writing you've ever seen. And it was like so fun for them to try to figure out how to be bad. How do I put commas in the wrong spots? How do I not capitalize? How do I? But then I could see, okay, I clearly know that you guys know all those things, but you still couldn't cite the research article correctly, even when you were trying to do it poorly. And so those are those challenges that you give kids that they can't look that up online. You know, there's, you can't Google like, can someone please print out the worst essay for me that's ever been written? And so I think those are the types of things that we kind of have to think outside the box sometimes on. Um, for those listeners that aren't really familiar with the rigor relevance um, relationships in quadrant A, B, C, and D, because you're talking a lot about quadrant A, but if they haven't used it in their district, could you just give a quick brief overview of each of the quadrants? So they know that we're talking about we're getting stuck in quadrant A. Of course you need quadrant A, but then how do we move to B, C, and D? 
Right. So quadrant A is your knowledge and acquisition in one content area, right? So it's learning the type of guns that they used in the Civil War. Like there's absolutely no other place that you need to know that other than in that social studies class, right? Um, it's, it's, it's knowledge-based information. Typically it's something that you can Google, right? Um, and, and you really don't necessarily have to use it any place else. When you move to quadrant B, you're still in your lower level of blooms, right? Um, knowledge and, and understanding, but you're, you've done some application kinds of things with them. They've tried to convert that to, it's more relevant. There's a, there's a real world experience that goes with that. So, um, if I am, if I'm trying to teach about tax code. Um, or if I'm trying to teach about the judicial system, maybe we, um, we go visit um, a judge or we have a judge in who's a guest speaker, right? Um, if I'm teaching about percentages, I might have kids calculate sale price instead of just doing a, a, a simple calculation or using the formula. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm trying to I'm trying to put some relevance to and, and apply that situation to some kind of a real world setting. Um, when I go to quadrant C, which is going up the bloom side of the rigor relevance framework. Now I'm going to get into things like analysis, evaluation, um, and, uh, and those kinds of things, but it's still on the left-hand side of the chart. It's straight above quadrant A. So it's still typically content driven. AP classes and honors classes live in quadrant C, right? Um, it's heavy content. It's, it's heavy use of that content, but we don't really ask people to do anything with it outside of that content area. So um, that one would be a quadrant C. Quadrant D is where project-based learning lives. Um, quadrant D is where high levels of thinking um, live. Quadrant D is where you have, you're on the high level of blooms and you're on the high level of relevance. And so you're gonna ask kids to do something with the things that they're thinking about. Um, and so um, an, an example that um, it, it might be, if you're, if you're trying to teach about, um, and I'm gonna go to social studies again, if you're trying to teach about the, the, the two-party system, right? Um, you, might have, you might have them look at, we were just talking uh, about the electoral college here the other day, uh, have them look at the electoral college and have them justify the maintenance of, or the dis, the the the, the disem, uh, dissembling the uh, the electoral college, and have them um, provide justification, right? Um, and then you send that to the Senate, right? Real world application uh, of a high complex problem because it's not that I just have to know what the electoral college is. I have to know how it functions, how it affects, what are the pros and cons, how has it impacted several elections, right? Um, what are, what, why do people like it? Why do they not like it? There's a lot that goes into that thing. And then if I have to then write a, a letter to my Senator to express my either pleasure or displeasure with the, the electoral college, now it becomes something that's real. We've been talking about quadrant A a lot, and I know that's from the rigor relevance framework. Could you just give a rundown for our listeners of that? Yeah. Uh, so drill and kill is A, right? Um, your scrimmages are probably going to be in the, the B and, and, well, your scrimmage could be any of those places, right? Um, because your scrimmage is application of, so you're going to be in that C and D range because you're, yeah, you're going to take that to a higher, more complex place. Your scrimmage could be in D, but it's going to be a lower level of, it's going to be, some, it's, it's going to be, you know, some real world application of things. Um, so you're going to think about it in a little bit different way, but we're not asking you to do anything unique and complex with it. Um, where you get into C and D is we're asking you to make predictions, right? We're asking you to um, evaluate whether something belongs or does not belong. We're asking you to um, create something new. Um, we're asking you to take the basic concepts from this piece of instruction and then create something new from it, right? So there's usually there's no right or wrong answer when you get into, especially quadrant D, you can't do that on a, on a test. That's usually some sort of a demonstrated learning um, yeah. because there's, there's more than one correct response. Right. And I think, well, with me even, I mean, it makes me think of throwing that ball, right? If you just ask Patrick McCombs to throw the ball, you're an A. But if you ask Patrick McCombs to throw the ball at a target specifically, maybe that's lined up. Now you're in B, right? But then if you're asking them to do it a scrimmage where he has an actual person 
catching it, right? So you can move on, move through those stages. And as teachers, we do that naturally. But the magic happens then when you're in that scrimmage with cooperative learning with your team, where you're able to then all of a sudden now that person that he just threw to scores and he can point to that person or point to his whole team at meets and say, yeah, we just did that. Right. And, and the quad D for him might be, you know, when you put C is going to be when you start sending defenders his way and he has to be able to read coverages. Quad D, quad D is based on what you just learned, create a new play. Right. Right. Yep. Based, on, based on what you just learned from that coverage scenario or that interception that you just threw or whatever, how could you change the dynamics of that play to make sure that defender wasn't there? Right. Right. And they That's do that all the time on the line, if you think about it. They're constantly making. Um, adjustments yeah. based on feedback, right? Yep. Um, and that's what we want to do with our kids in class. We want to give them that instant feedback and we want to hear their feedback too. We want to hear um, how, you know, you know, that student feedback to us is so important. And when we honor that, um, that's when the students are like, yeah, I want to be in Miss Jones class. I want to be in Miss Bingle's class because I'm heard there. Um, we do critical thinking there. I can see life skills happening within that content. And I don't feel as though I'm just doing isolated activities every day just for the sake of doing them. Okay, so why is student-centered um, instructional planning so important? And I think we've kind of covered this already, but when teachers are looking at their priority standards in their curriculum um, and basically deciding, okay, so here's my priority standards. I've broken them down into my learning targets. I know what my success criteria is. What are now the high yield strategies that I know will give me the most bang for my buck to use for that skill? Like, how did they decipher what strategies are the best ones to use in that in that specific yeah. plan? Sorry, yes, I'm yeah, fumbling yeah. now. It, instructional strategies are really kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? I mean, you can have the best plan out there, but if you can't pull it off in a way that number one accomplishes your goal. Uh, but number two, engages your kids in the accomplishment of that goal, um, you're really not going to get very far. And so that's why I think, you know, um, <clears throat> instructional planning where you do, where you choose strategies at the same time that you're looking at what my learning goals and my learning targets are is really important because your strategy has to match your target, right? If your, if your strategy is a quad A or if your target is a quad A fact, fact, based piece of information, the strategy that you use for it may not need to be real complex, right? You don't have to have a real big collaborative conversation to know um, <laughs> the, the, the definition of the political parties, right? Or whatever. Whatever. Um, yeah. but, but at some point in time, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Remember when Kahoot came out? And yeah, I mean, it's still huge. Kids will hear the Kahoot music and be like, whoa, it's Kahoot. Yep. Everybody loves Kahoot, right? And so I, I will actually go into classrooms or I'll be talking, I'll be in, observing PLCs and, and, and those kinds of things. And, and the teachers will go, so what can we do with Kahoot? Right. <laughs> Instead of the standard or the skill, it's about right. Kahoot. Like, time out. Like the first, let's start with the standard and let's see if Kahoot is even appropriate, right? Um, so one of my favorite like big conceptual questions, um, and, and, and I got this from, from a friend of mine, um, who posed this new as a social studies teacher and posed the question to me and this is this has been a couple of years ago and said hey vic like if john f kennedy was still alive today would he be a democrat or a republican if he was involved in politics and i'm like that is an amazing question right mm -hmm. i can't use, i can't use kahoot to ask and <laughs> ask that question right i can i can i can put a kahoot in that says would jfk have been a democrat or republican if he were active in politics today and the response i would get is either Republican or Democrat, or Democrat. Right? that gets me nowhere. And it gets me nowhere in, in terms of the conversation. And because the real conversation in that question is, what did John F. Kennedy believe when he was president, right? Um, what did Democrats believe then? What did Republicans believe then? What do Democrats believe today? What do Republicans believe today, right? Um, has his philosophy changed at all? Given the dynamic today, would his philosophy have changed, right? Because you have some of his family dynamics. You could like, it's a really, like, I could, I could give that question to a group of government students and they would be busy for nine weeks. Oh, totally. They would be researching, but they would be so fascinated because it's something different 
to do. Yeah. I mean, the only reason Kahoot might be a good segue is because then you would know which percentage of your students think one way or the other. But that's it. That's that's all the data you're getting from that. And it's doing nothing for the depth of knowledge for your kids. Right. So, so I think the key to, to any time you, you pick an instructional strategy is to really look at the complexity of your learning target. Like we're, we're on blooms, right? We're on blooms. Do I need to hit this instructionally um, so that I know that that the strategy that I select doesn't either overkill it or underkill it? Mm -hmm. and, and the importance is to start with the with the, the learning target. Don't start with the strategy, right? Don't don't say, how can I use a four square today or how can I use a jigsaw today? It has to be I need my students to accomplish this target. What's the best way that I can get that level of learning out of them? Right. And that in this case, it might be a jigsaw on articles about, um, you know, current Republican Party where they stand versus the Republican Party during when JFK was president. And they do a jig. Everybody's got different articles about Democrats, Republicans or whatever. And that's their they're gaining that foundational knowledge. But then yeah. they might have a Socratic seminar or some type of discussion structure after that. Um, you know, once they've presented all their knowledge and they've kind of gained their argument, you know, or it could be an argumentative paragraph that they're going to share or a speech or whatever, but it, there needs to be not the cahoot. Think about, and I think that's where we fall short sometimes, is we get so excited, especially with COVID and all the new tools that are out. We're like, yes, we're going to use this new tool, but why? Like, is it achieving what you want it to achieve? <laughs> Right. Yeah, and it, because the, the key is, is it doesn't matter how engaged your students are if they're not engaged in the instructional purpose that you intended, right? Um, it, it, then it's just fun, right? You have to you have to leverage that enthusiasm to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And I think and we're that, not against fun. Like, let's just be honest. In our department, we're not against fun. We want the kids to have fun. We want the kids to enjoy going to school. We just want to make sure they're engaged in a way that is. It, that well, and honestly, they can tell. Like my kids knew that my instruction was intentionally planned because I just like I just kind of I would take their feedback. We would go over it under the doc cam. I'd be like, "Oh, we're super weak on this. Okay, so so tomorrow we're gonna work on this." Like they knew I was good. I was mismatching and changing things in my strategies based on feedback that I was getting from them. You know, and I think that's a great point. You know, we were talking about the coaching analogy earlier. And never within the system of coaching um, do you hide your plan from, from your team. No, right? I mean, it just doesn't happen, right? I mean, every coach is super, super transparent. There's a reason we go to the weight room, right? There's a reason that we run the drills that we run. There's a reason that, like, there's a reason for every, there's a reason that we practice in the, in the order that we practice. There's a reason that, we, right? And, and they're, they're completely transparent about that. And so the kids can get through the things that maybe they don't like because of the transparency and the relationship between what I do today has a significant impact on my ability to perform tomorrow. Yes. And, and I think it's yeah. the same way in class. I think you have to be transparent with kids and say, everything we're doing builds to something, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that we're doing and like the JFK thing, like that's not a one day lesson. You're going to be doing that stuff forever. And, and, you know, you you start you start planning out those specific learning targets and right before I can answer that question I have to know the difference between a Democrat and a Republican, right? So where do I start? What's my learning strategy to to achieve that particular learning target? Now I need to know something about JFK. What's my strategy for achieving that target? And mm -hmm. so I think you know breaking those those big learning learning objectives down or those learning goals down into those specific targets and that's where your instruction comes from. Right. I think a lot of times people try to plan for the big goal instead of really focusing in on those little targeted pieces that I've got to build along the way. So and I think it's it's a lot. It's hard, though. I mean, so as a teacher, it, I've seen it. I've heard it from my friends. It's hard to break up with chronological order of events or I have to teach this in the this way because this is, you know, the, the dreaded. This is the way it's always been done. But honestly, that's, I mean, for me, I became a teacher because I liked to do the moving parts and the creative and and digging deep and seeing what the kids knew. And I wasn't there to teach this map, you know, I wanted to make the map as I kind of went, you know, and um, 
I still do that. I mean, I do that with my lessons with the teachers. I, I want to I want to make it so it's effective and important for them. Um, so I think sometimes it's hard though, because teachers might say like, oh my gosh, this is blowing my mind. I've always just lesson planned and I've never given them scrimmages. So let's go back to the metaphor. Okay. So we said, clearly we need to have drills, right? Which are like that quadrant A and some practices, maybe that's quadrant B before we get to our scrimmages, which are, you know, C and D ish and our overall games. But like, how do I get there? Like as a teacher, that's like maybe never thought of this in this context before of this game plan. Do I work? Like, how do I do that? Do I need to make sure I understand rigor? Do I need to make sure I understand my priority standards? Do I need to work with my PLC? Because I'm telling you right now, I would be overwhelmed if I didn't have my team to work with and bounce ideas off of, you know? Um, so what would you suggest for, for them to move into a game plan that's more uh, student centered than teacher centered. Yeah, I think I think I'd start. I would definitely start with my team, right? My 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 data team, my PLC, um, because multiple heads and concepts and experience and ideas are way better than one. Um, we do that all the time down here, right? We come up with we have a we have a, a, a course that we need to teach. Um, somebody needs some information on something, and the first thing we do is we 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 set up a learning goal, and then we go in and we talk to each other, right? Um, how is how can we break this down? How can we make this happen? So I think having multiple minds involved in that is is crucial, and being open, especially if those those people are open to those conversations about how do we focus this on the kids, right? So I think yes, you start with your team. You have to start with your standard, and you have to start by knowing what your priority standard is, um, it, because if you're if you're teaching if you're teaching minor standards, if you're teaching supporting standards with the same time frame um, as you are your your priority standards, then you're going to force yourself into this this idea of surface learning, right? Because now you're covering. And you have to have a, 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 a good understanding of what really is essential learning, um, what what is that priority. And, and we've got some resources that, that we've got posted and we can post about how do you determine priority standards? In our district, a lot of those standards have already been selected and they're on curriculum um, websites. Um, so at least people don't have to, to guess at that. Um, right. There's so many that are like looking at us. They're probably listening to us like thinking, what is a priority standard? Yeah. But our district has broken those down for yeah. the teachers. So the yeah. teachers know what those are. Yep. It's just getting like, okay, what's my next right. steps now that I know them? And I think that's taking that standard and, and understanding that how does that fit into and, and really kind of breaking it down. So now I have a standard. That standard is going to become, or, or those standards, sometimes there's more than one, is going to become my unit. So kind of what's my time frame for my unit? Um, what are my kids? And then, and then in that big standard, being able to establish those success criteria, what does it look like when kids know, right? This is my learning goal. What does it look like when kids know so that I have clarity at what it, 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 that says this is what success looks like? And then being able to break that back in order for me to know that what's the found, what are the foundational skills that I need? Do I need to We're, yep, we're back to backwards design again, right? So I know what my end goal is. I know what my I know what my end quote unquote assessment is going to be. How do I take that backwards in terms of and create a pre-assessment so I can find out where my kids are at, and and then where where I have my gaps. That's that becomes my 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 instructional targets, my learning targets. Um, for, for my daily lessons, right? And and it is. So this is my target. This is what I need my kids to know. How do we do that? How are we going to pull that off? Is is direct instruction the best way? Is doing some kind of an exploratory learning the best way? Um, is reciprocal teaching the best way? Like what's for this one target or the, these two targets? What's the best instructional approach that I can I can deliver, right? Um, and then you go in and you do it, and then you formatively assess, right? You determine what your formative assessment is going to be. And when I say formatively assess, I'm not talking about giving your kids a pen and pencil test, right? Not necessarily. I'm talking about observing what they do, having an exit ticket for them on the way out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start assessing my kids' knowledge on narrow targets on really regular intervals. So let's say I did a day or two of instruction and I did an exit ticket to see where the kids were at. 
if I have misconceptions, I only have a day or two of misconceptions to fix, right? If I wait to assess to the end of the unit, I have no idea where they ran off the track during that four week unit, right? So I think, you know, it, 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 it sounds kind of mind blowing, but if you kind of take it step by step, um, we've got a couple of forms that we can, we can share um, that kind of, kind of break it down a little bit. We can do a, do an example for them and, and we'll, we'll throw a, uh, throw a template up there, but um, you know, it, it's taking those really um, intentional steps of, I need them to know this, this is how it breaks down. That, that's what it looks like in, 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 in instruction in my classroom every day. Um, and then going back and seeing how they're doing. If you get back with your PLC team and, you know, three of the four of you got great results in class, then let's talk about what went different. Um, what happened differently in my class that, that I didn't get that result and, and being open to having those conversations, right? But I think above everything, you've got to be transparent with your kids. Um, it, your knowledge of that playbook, right? Your knowledge of that game plan doesn't do any good, is no good to anybody if you, if your team doesn't know about it, right? There's, there's, what if, what if the chiefs held their playbook and never showed it to their player, right? Like, I mean, we laugh at that because we think it's ridiculous. There, there are teachers who hold their playbook close to their chest and they, they, they don't share it with kids. They, I actually had a teacher tell me once we were talking about pre-testing and they said, I don't want to pre-test my kids because then they're going to know what's on the test. And I'm like, well, that's the point, isn't it? Like, isn't the point of teaching so they know what's on the test? Um, and and they were so worried that that was cheating. And I'm like, no, it's assessment. That's what we do. Learning is what we do, right? Because your test at the end of this, your test is going to be much more complex than that foundational pretest that you just gave them, right? And so, um, yeah, it, we have to give them the playbook. We have to we have to take all of that information that we have in our heads or that we put down on a piece of paper that is our guide to instruction, and we have to put it in kid friendly language, and we have to put it in their hands, and we have to teach them what that looks like, and we have to do with it. Yeah, no, I, I well, I obviously I absolutely agree with you, and I'm not going to disagree with the director. Um, but I but I think um, it reminds me of when coaches watch tape with their players. You know, it's like, just give it, you're, you're transparent. We, we got to talk through our failures and where we missed a step and correct those things so that we're better the next time. And I can only th think of myself, I mean, I was an English teacher and I would put up anonymously an essay and it was always in a different hour and I would kind of mix things up, but I'd be like, let's watch the tape kind of in, in a sense. Let's, let's go play by play and see where do we miss some steps and where can we correct? And if we're not transparent with them, they don't know. I mean, I didn't have to hardly grade them because if I walked through a few of those, if they watched a few of those tapes, right? If they looked through a few of those essays, they could look at their own essay and be like, oh, I did that too. And they could correct themselves. Um, and, and that's where, that's when they really are starting to take that intrinsic motivation and ownership of their learning because they know the game plan. They know what the coach expects, the teacher, um, and they know where their, their targets are, their, their skills and targets. Everyone, you know, has that competitive edge where they, they really do want to win. They want to be good students. They, I mean, I don't think any kid really wakes up in the morning and thinks today is the day I am going to torture my teacher again. I mean, I really do believe in the good of, I, they want to learn. They just have been conditioned. And unfortunately, that school is not scrimmages um, that are complex and productive struggle and difficult. Um, school is drill and kill. Yeah, th well, think about Hattie, right? Boredom is a minus- Four eight. Know, minus point four? Point four eight, yeah, negative point four eight. I mean, yeah. you, you lose a year's worth of growth because your kids are bored in class. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing to think about is, I mean, think about the people that are really great at what they do, right? Like Patrick Mahomes doesn't need Andy Reid to sit next to him to watch film. Right. right. He can break down his own performance, right? There are times that they're going to watch film together, but Patrick Mahomes can learn from watching film now because he's already watched film with Andy Reid, right? He doesn't need him. And that's our goal for kids, right? Our goal for kids is can you perform and think and do the things that we want you to do, even if I'm not standing over your shoulder, because that's what learning is.
right? Yep. The rest, the, 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 if you need me over your shoulder, then I'm still guiding. I'm still your guide. I'm still mentoring you. Um, you haven't learned it, but, and you, and, or you don't have the confidence to take it with you. But our goal should be for every kid to be able to, to take the skill sets that we give them and be able to apply them whether I'm standing behind them or not. And it's, and it's a beautiful thing. And I'll tell you what, you want to build a kid's confidence. That's the way to build a kid's confidence. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I, on that note, I will plug in that self-efficacy of students and their ability to feel confident in your content area is super high on Hattie because um, as soon as they feel like they're good in math or they're good in science or, you know, they're good in social studies or whatever, um, their ability, their just whole mind shift. I mean, you're talking about growth mindset and, um, and, it, and everybody's like, well, Hattie doesn't believe in growth mindset. He does. And he's even said he does. He just actually calls it self-efficacy um, where they, they are, the, he likes the idea of it. He just thinks that they need to be able to see it a little bit more clearly in their work, not necessarily just oh, I, I can be better the next day, but literally I can see that I have improved. And so I think that's where that success criteria comes in. Okay, this has been awesome, Vic. We're over an hour, so I got we got to wrap it up. But um, if listeners want to learn more from us as a department, um, obviously Vicki is my is my boss. She's my, my the director of our department. Um, and that's why I wanted to finish season one um, with the boss, the bomb. Um, but we are... Um, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I mean, we really have branched out um, as a department because we do want to reach, I think, as many teachers as possible. We don't want to just reach our Gilbert teachers, even though we love them. Um, but we want kids everywhere to learn and be successful. Um, so if you guys do want to follow us, um, I'll give you that information at the end of the episode. But um, right now, I just want to thank you for being on and, and taking time on, um, later in the afternoon to get this done and, and record with me. This was awesome. I had a great time, Britt. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Learning Unlocked and finding out more about the game plan, the differences between lesson planning, intentional instruction, and using the rigor relevance framework to guide your instruction in your classrooms. Just as a reminder that we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GPS Prof Growth. That's at G-P-S-P-R-O-F-G-R-O-W-T-H. If you've listened today as a GPS educator, you can receive PD recertification credit by visiting our employee hub page and navigating to Digital PD On Demand. For more information or resources from this episode, please visit our website at learningunlocked.lipson.com forward slash website. We are distributed by Lipson. Lipson is spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N to Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Audible. Episodes are also available on our YouTube channel under Playlists. Our music is from Melody Loops. Thanks again, key holders. Keep unlocking that curiosity, creativity, and innovation within your students. Stay kind and courageous, and I will see you in January of 2021.